Okay, okay. When you think of classic animated horror movies, Coraline is one of those iconic projects that scarred the lives of many children. Even if you haven't seen Coraline, you know all about it. And everyone knows the whole button eyes element. Ugh. Well, considering the fact that I was too scared to watch Chicken Run as a kid, it's probably quite a relief for me personally to have never seen this movie before now. And most stop motion projects, to be honest. I've still not seen Nightmare Before Christmas, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Corpse Bride, The Pirates, any of them. But since the spooky season is upon us, it seems a no brainer to tackle this movie and dissect the scene that changed Coraline. And to me, the turning moment with some interesting techniques to talk about is the point when the other mother finally starts to reveal herself in her stretched out form. For those who don't know how we reach this point, though this synopsis is mostly for me, Coraline lives an unhappy life in her new home. The world is grey and dreary, and she's seemingly neglected by her parents too. But then she discovers this alternate dimension where everything is opposite. Now the world is colourful, her parents granting her everything she wants and generally parking up her life. Until they've turned around to demand she sews buttons into her eyes in order to stick around. And now when she goes to sleep, she's not taken back and the world around her is beginning to show its deceptions. And right now, she's looping back to the house from outside after a reassuring chat with a cat. Good kitty. We've just come to learn this whole world is entirely constructed out of the house grounds and nothing else. But at least Coraline has an ally. And so she turns back to the front entrance of the house. directing our eye to the entrance through the single light source as it's the other mother guiding Coraline there. And as she steps up we see she's wearing starry pyjamas. This isn't a null point, it's entirely intentional, as this outfit was one that the other mother specifically gifted to Coraline to wear, but symbolically it links to a myth we hear near the start of the film about a bottomless well. It's supposed to be so deep. If you fell to the bottom and looked up, you see a sky full of stars in the middle of the day. Coraline is so deep into this web of deception that she, at this point, is seeing stars. Cool. And so she grabs a makeshift weapon in a walking stick and uses it to crowbar her way through the door. The very fact that it's locked like this suggests she's not meant to be here, like the other mother has child locked the house. And the wider camera angle on this feels like you're a spectator rather than part of the action. After all, according to the other father earlier, boring our eyes will be on Coraline. What follows next is your classic composition of an ominous new room. No light inside, the only source coming from the crack in the door, and our protagonist silhouetted against it. It's all so unnerving. As is this entire world as we've come to learn. It closes in on Coraline in this dim environment, keeping the audience further out of the loop as even if there is something visible for Coraline to react to, we certainly don't get to. Building up that suspense ever more. Ugh, and then we do see something. Kinda hard to perceive with this low lighting and obscuring shadow, but as you do recognize it, you see it as a bug. One of those classic make your skin crawl subjects when it comes to horror tropes. And as Coraline reacts as we do to this sudden change in aesthetic, the house didn't have moving bug furniture before, we come to see it light up. And amongst the shadows are more glowing bugs. The camera pulls out so we catch more of the room to see, A whole bug-inspired room, seemingly out of left field, until you realise there's been bug imagery everywhere. Insects invading the dodgy shower, the decoration in her room holding her picture frame, the dress of other mother this whole time with its little backside extensions, and even the wallpaper in the little door room in reality has bugs imprinted into them. It's hard to spot, but it's ever present. Ugh. Though if I was to bring up a small gripe with this scene, I think this shot has a small cinematic mistake in it, and that's the fact that it doesn't direct your eye well enough into the next shot. I'm too encapsulated by the backlighting on the walls or the bug furniture that I don't even notice that other mother is rotating in this shot. So when it suddenly cuts to her on the couch, it seems a bit unexpected, when I think the intention is meant to be you're directed to see her, and then you cut to her. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like they needed an additional camera movement or boosted lights on the couch, or have her bigger on the frame than just tiny in the corner. Maybe? 
Anyway, Other Mother is here and ready to greet Coraline. Of course, in a much less subtle way for her intentions this time around. Spinning around on the couch, which is unnerving for how unnatural it all seems. She's really in control of this whole reality. They say even the proudest spirit can be broken with love. And now here she is talking about breaking spirits. Ugh. Preying on unhappy children by luring them in with love and paradise, and now Coraline is forced to sit. Of course, chocolate never hurts. Like what? What was originally a gift of what every child wants is now revealed to be more bugs. Was this what Coraline was actually eating when she was feasting on her visits before? <sighs> It certainly seems to be like a delicacy for other mother, and not even eating in a merciful way. Dragging them out in two, torturously, considering these bugs were still alive. More insinuations of evil beyond just, this is gross looking. But then... I want to be with my real mom and dad. Coraline gets right to the point. Ever confrontative and headstrong because she's frustrated and certainly not shy. All the while, Other Mother just eats across a third of the frame, readying to feast on her final meal. Is that any way to talk to your mother? You aren't my mother. Oof. I don't know if this is brave or naive, but it's the classic stepmom argument lines that really have an impact right now. And with each shot reverse shot, we get closer to our characters as the drama intensifies. Apologize at once. The red couch in the background in the room only building the villainous view of other mother more, whilst Caroline's shots are more blue, another motif of the movie. List everything that's blue. Just let me work. Even though yellow and orange is more Coraline's colour. But being the gift from other mother suggests Coraline is still very much tangled in her web. She's not got full independence even at this point if the colour theory is to be believed. I'll give you to the count of three. And now it's the classic parental punishment technique, and an excuse to pull the camera away as both take a step back from the camera, leading into... One. Two. There it is, the transition. Other mother first seemingly rising as the background drops away as her cheekbones become more defined and angular. It almost seems subtle as the camera works to track her head. It could have been a tilt upwards from down below. But no, stop motion love their one-shot transitions. Three! And then we get the full spectacle. First showing just a glimpse of this new form with an over-the-shoulder shot and giving us some of that height comparison with Coraline, and then the reverse of this with a low angle up to other mother's skeletal look. It's still the same look underneath, but everything is stretched to be as unnerving and evil looking as possible. Gone is the soft circular look. What are you doing? Ow, that hurts! And now with superior reach and all subtlety out of the window, she can go on the offensive. Plus, Caroline was disobeying anyway, so it's time for punishment. Camera cutting as it hits her face because it's uncomfortable, and the last place we want to be is up close and personal to this thing. And then, with another head-spinning quirk of this dimension, mirrors are traversable. How symbolic for Coraline to be trapped in a place where there's a parallel image being displayed of two worlds. Welcome to Halfway. Think I should cover more stop motion? Suggest it on our Discord, or subscribe if you haven't already. You may come out when you've learned to be a loving daughter. And so, Coraline is chucked in solitary confinement. You know, the classic punishment trope. And here you could say is the deepest part of this dimensional pit, as now her starry pyjamas are actively glowing. The mythical stars are indeed all you can see in this light. If this wasn't a movie and we'd like to see the environment, please. Only for our next reveal... Hush and shush, for the bell dam might be listening. Coraline isn't alone here, and we get the first official name of the other mother, the Beldum. Anyway, the reveal of these voices is first the uncomfortable wide angle as we see an unrevealed lump in the bedsheets in the corner of the room, and then as we get closer, of course the camera does too, until... Who are you? 
Now, I'm not entirely sure how these ghost children were filmed, but it's an interesting ethereal effect that makes them completely stark from the rest of the cast. Seemingly at a lower frame rate that cross dissolves over itself and composed on top afterwards. Not to mention horrifying, I hate the screaming girl. And with them unchained to gravity, they can move in interesting ways, right up to the camera, swirling around Coraline and up above her, all to expedite the final mysteries of the Beldum. She spied on our lives through the little doll's eyes. Talking in rhymes for that extra spooky, riddly vibe, revealing how the Beldum knew of Coraline's predicament, as well as what will happen if she accepts the eye sewing. She said that she loved us. But she locked us here, and ate up our lives. In case there were any children considering the ideal for a piece of paradise against neglecting parents, it's also interesting the wording of ate up our lives. It's not eat them. Perhaps it's more of a spiritual thing, sucking the life force out of them in some other way, like a spider sucks their prey and shrivels them. We also see one of the ghost children's spying dolls at the start of the movie being removed of all of its fluff, whilst Coraline's doll is stuffed with sawdust or something. Perhaps that's the life force difference between a subject that's been fully drained and another that hasn't. These other children, by the way, you can spot in all sorts of earlier hints. The dining room has their portraits on the wall. The sad ice cream boy paintings is the ghost boy. And of course, missing children were mentioned multiple times earlier in the film. And so, as the ghosts float about and tell their tale, briefly giving Coraline some button eyes of her own, nice, they tell of how finding their hidden eyes will help free their soul before wrapping themselves back up under the bedsheets, the sequence finishing exactly where it started. Find our eyes, mistress, and our souls will be freed. It's also interesting how the souls address Coraline, always as miss or mistress. I guess because they too look up to her? Is it an age thing? I wonder. Anyway, on that point, Coraline finally says, uh, I'll try. Holding onto the bars of the bed, which when composed like this, sure do look like prison bars, adding more to the imprisonment themes. With a Coraline that is now motivated to take down the Beldum. Beating her is my only chance. And so to give us progress on that path, To finish off this revelation, we come to see its other YB, a friend from before, shown not only to be assisting, but now with an agonized looking forced smile. Horrifying. I hope that feels better. And from there, it all continues, with YB helping push Caroline back through the small door so she can finally return to her home dimension. He'll be fine. He's only made of sawdust anyway, like anything else created by the Beldum. All the while, the Beldum is coming, calling for Coraline. What a green flag of a guy other YB is. <laughs> a green flag. And from there, she escapes. This sequence is the turning point of the movie, of course. From a plot point, it changes the dynamic directly after jumping off of the whole button eyes thing, but it's also here that so many elements and motifs finally come together. The bugs, the stars, the sawdust even. Plus, there's still more, like the spider elements and Coraline being like a trapped prey, like the fly headpiece she wears on her head. God, I could talk about the other elements for hours. This movie genuinely feels like some sort of Kafka production, where there's all these characters that are weird and don't really make sense as this character goes through some sort of turmoil. I really like it. Kids introduced to Kafka. Huh. And this sequence begins the visuals that can really scar your childhood memories with that angular transition. And to think, it somehow gets worse in the movie. Having now seen this whole thing, I gotta say, this project is an absolute masterpiece. I'm loving how rich every scene and element is, with all of its symbolism and writing. I guess adapting a novella is a really good prompt to jump off of. Just remember kids, you're not being neglected, you're just impatient. R right? I mean, I guess an 11 year old could just be overstimulated for a few days and perceive it all like this, but Kinda also feels like gaslighting to me. <laughs> Appreciate what you've got and hope it's not genuine neglect. Plus, though not the original intention, putting it in stop motion animation helps and so much in giving us that creep factor because of the way some things move. I mean, if I'm spooked by a simple chicken shot, then of course this is the real deal. I'm mad at myself now for not seeing it sooner. So hey, maybe it's an opportunity to hop on my backlog of other unseen stop motions. For now, I'd best leave it here. My name's been Daz. You didn't really care. 
and I'll see you in a bit.